Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is series arrangements of DC sources. Our objective is to examine DC sources in series aiding and series opposing relationships. Additionally, we'll explore advanced applications of Kirchhoff's voltage law. Finally, we'll examine a DC power supply with sources in series aiding relationship. The lecture operates under the presumption the viewer is an intimate familiar with series DC circuit analysis and Kirchhoff's voltage law. If at any time you feel you're over your head, please take the time to click the provided links to bring yourself up to speed. As you are no doubt aware, Kirchhoff's voltage law states that for any closed loop, the summation of voltage rises will be equal to the summation of voltage drops. In summary, what comes up must come down. Up until this point, we've explored circuits with only one rise in the form of a single voltage source. Circuits with more than one source can and do exist. Perhaps the simplest arrangement being an inline or series arrangement of sources of which two types exist, series aiding and series opposing. Long story short, sources in series add up, accounting for their polarity. Allow me to demonstrate. Consider a 12 volt battery supplying power to a DC motor that is modeled as a 6 ohm resistor. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates current through the motor will be 2 amps. A subsequent application of the power equation demonstrates that the motor will be consuming 24 watts. Let's say that doesn't cut it, and you need more power. The simple solution to this problem is to stack another 12 volt battery on top of the first such that their polarities mutually reinforce each other. Given the direction of conventional current travel induced by each source is in the same direction, this is understandably what is known as a series aiding relationship. Let's apply Kirchhoff's voltage law to this configuration. Starting here and traveling clockwise in the direction of conventional current, we encounter a 12 volt rise followed by another 12 volt rise the motor undoubtedly must experience a 24 volt drop. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates current through the motor will be 4 amps. Doubling the voltage has doubled the current. A subsequent application of the power equation demonstrates the motor will be consuming 24 volts times 4 amps or 96 watts, a fourfold increase in power simply by doubling the voltage. Series aiding relationships should be very easy to understand. Sources in series aiding relationships have polarities that mutually reinforce each other such that conventional current travel induced by each source flows in the same direction. Common applications for series aiding relationships include scenarios like battery packs, where a single battery won't cut it, but perhaps two, three, four, or more in a series aiding relationship can. If you think about it, batteries themselves are a series aiding relationship of individual cells. A typical lead acid battery itself is a collection of cells that each have a nominal voltage of 2.1 volts and when strung in the series aiding relationship of 6, they mutually reinforce each other such that the battery has a nominal voltage of 12.6 volts. Solar panels use a similar arrangement of individual cells, each of which may only produce a paltry 0.5 volts each. However, when they're configured in a series aiding arrangement of 60, the solar panel produces 30 volts. While we're on the subject of batteries and solar panels, it's worth noting that current through sources in a series arrangement is the same. This is why a single dead cell in a battery, or an errant leaf or a frisbee shading an individual solar cell has such an inordinate negative impact on output. If any cell in the battery or solar panel is acting as a choke point for current, all current is reduced. Let's now examine a different type of series arrangement of sources, that of series opposing. As you can probably guess, a series opposing arrangement of sources is one where the polarities of each source oppose each other such that conventional current travel induced by each source would flow in the opposite direction. Your instinctive reaction to series opposing relationships would be understandable. Why would anyone ever do something so stupid? For example, consider a series opposing relationship of a 15 volt source and a 3 volt source. Why not just use a 12 volt source? Yes, this is all kinds of stupid and you would only find such egregious stupidity on display in the example section of a textbook designed to confuse generation after generation of first year electronic students. No one ever does anything this dumb because a single 12 volt source is way cheaper and way lighter than an expensive heavy 15 volt source counteracted by a 3 volt source. Series opposing relationships can however be used to explain the battery charging process. I present to you the most primitive battery charging system ever. Consider a discharged nominal 12 volt battery currently at 10 volts state of charge and a battery charger at 14 volts with a variable current controlling resistor in between set up in a series opposing relationship. Given its preference, the 14 volt battery charger would push current clockwise through this system. 
whereas the discharge battery presently at 10 volts would push current counterclockwise through this system. These two sources are in opposition to one another. However, the higher 14 volt battery charger clearly dominates this relationship. Current would undoubtedly flow from the charger through the variable current control resistor and into the discharged battery. Given this direction of current flow, the voltage drop across the variable current controlling resistor would be oriented positive to negative left to right. Let's say the battery can handle at maximum 5 amps of charge current. Let's see if we can determine the resistance necessary to limit current to the specified 5 amps. A Kirchhoff's voltage law analysis of this circuit starting here and traveling in the clockwise direction demonstrates that a rise of 14 volts is equal to the voltage drop across the variable current controlling resistor plus the voltage drop across the discharge battery presently at 10 volts. Yes, we know the 10 volt battery really is an active source. However, given our chosen direction of travel, in a positive, out a negative, we're assuming the discharge 10 volt battery is a drop. That's what's great about Kirchhoff's voltage law. As long as you're consistent, you will get a right answer. An algebraic rearrangement of the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation, solving for the unknown voltage drop across the current controlling resistor, demonstrates the variable current controlling resistor must experience a 4 volt drop. If we needed to limit the charge current to 5 amps, an application of Ohm's law demonstrates the variable current controlling resistor needs to be adjusted to 800 milliohms. Let's say we left this system in this state and came back to find that the voltage across the charging battery has risen from 10 to 11 volts. Another Kirchhoff's voltage law analysis of this circuit starting here and traveling in the clockwise direction demonstrates that a rise of 14 volts is equal to the voltage drop across the variable current controlling resistor plus the voltage drop across the discharge battery presently at 11 volts. An algebraic rearrangement of the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation solving for the unknown voltage drop across the current controlling resistor demonstrates the variable current controlling resistor presently set at 800 milliohms must be experiencing a 3 volt drop. Another application of Ohm's law demonstrates that the current through the variable current controlling resistor presently set at 800 milliohms is 3.75 amps. This is too low, considering the battery can handle upwards of 5 amps. What should we do to bring current up to the specified maximum of 5 amps? If you're tracking, you should realize we need to decrease resistance. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates the variable current controlling resistor needs to be decreased to 600 milliohms. If after a period of time, voltage across the charging battery rose to 12 volts and then the 13 volts would again have to decrease and decrease again the resistance of the variable current controlling resistor to keep current near the specified maximum of 5 amps. This ensures that the battery doesn't get cooked by excessive current but doesn't take all day to get fully charged. If we perform this iterative process over and over, we'd eventually see the voltage across the terminals of the charging battery steadily rise to a maximum of 14 volts at which time all current flow ceases and the battery is fully charged. This by the way is a serious oversimplification of battery charging. We'll examine batteries, battery discharge characteristics and battery charging methods in greater detail in later lectures. Importantly, for this simplified example, as the voltage across the terminals of the charging battery steadily rises and rises, you will note that the differential between the charger and the charging battery steadily erodes. If we were to keep the variable current controlling resistor fixed the whole time, rather than adjusting it, we'd most likely see charge current drop, thus the charge process would take longer to complete. However, by steadily monitoring voltage and current, we can progressively change the resistance of the variable current controlling resistor so charge current remains close to the permitted maximum of 5 amps. Automated chargers do this at a much faster and frequent rate, ensuring charge current never exceeds the specified maximum and the battery is charged in an efficient and timely manner. Importantly, at no time do we ever hook the charger and the discharge battery in a series opposing relationship with no current controlling element in between, especially at the onset. If we were to directly connect a 14 volt charger in series opposing relationship with a discharge battery at 10 volts with no current controlling element in between, consider the voltage differential across and the current through the theoretically zero ohm wire linking the two batteries. Ohm's law would demonstrate that a massive, massive, theoretically infinite surge of current would surely cook both the charger, the discharge battery, and anything in close proximity. This is no way to safely charge a battery. Again, at all times, the variable current controlling resistor between the sources in a series opposing relationship effectively keeps current below the specified maximum. If you want to think of it this way, the variable current controlling resistor is kind of straddling two hills. At the onset of the charge, one leg is 14 volts high, 
whereas the other leg is only 10 volts high for a difference of 4 volts. A little while later, one leg is still 14 volts high, whereas the other leg is now 11 volts for a differential of 3 volts. 14 volts, 12 volts for a difference of 2 volts. 14 volts, 13 volts for a difference of 1 volt. And on and on until eventually at the end of the charge, one leg is 14 volts and the other leg is also at 14 volts for a difference of 0 volts. At this point, the battery would stop charging. 